Look inside your closet, did you? The hell are you looking at me so funny for? Sorry, Santa. I had to go. Oh, is that you? I thought it was me. We got a job, Willie. I'm talking millions this time. I got an associate who's got this thing all lined up. What's it been, 15 years? Mom. Well, you still hit like your daddy. Eat me. What, you don't trust your mother? Yeah, I trust her about as far as I can throw you. Damn it! And I trust you about as far as I can throw her. I don't I didn't even know you had a mom. You think I was just hatched? I traveled across the country to rob a charity. You got a problem with that? You damn right I got a problem with it. No way these assholes have two million bucks. Will you keep it down? Let's go time. What is he doing here? Elf! You got smaller. I even got minis for the munchkin. Don't you ever call me that. Well, if you got a problem with that, you take it up with the Lollipop Guild. Shut the hell up. Cash only. $10 or more. Hundreds or better. Look at those cheeks. That's the ugliest baby on the planet. Damn. Hi, I'm Diane. Welcome to Giving City. I ain't exactly what you call the romantic type, but I gotta tell you, you got gigantic. Excuse me? You need a hug. Let go of me, damn it. I'm starting to feel like Christmas. Miserable, both of you. Sometimes I need to be bad. When you don't have real family, you gotta make a new one. And I know you're not the Santa, but you're still my Santa. Merry Christmas. One time, I ate too much turkey bacon. I didn't poop for two weeks. For four weeks. Is this your spawn? Do I look like I made him? Well, if this ain't fetal alcohol syndrome, then what is it? Bad Santa too. Give it up one more time. I had a chance to see this movie last week. It's as funny as the original, if not funnier. It really goes for the jugular, I think, in every joke, in every way possible. Billy, uh, it's been how long since the first one, and, and what brought you back? It's been 13 years, and uh, they say, yeah, 13 years. And uh, there was, uh, you know, the studio was sold and then bought back, and then the new Miramax came around, and uh, so there's some red tape to fight through. You know, and then once we got the go ahead, um, we wanted to make sure we got the right story, the right script. So it took that long, but I think in a lot of ways it helped us because as opposed to putting one out right away with the same people and we're kind of doing the same thing, you get to see Brett at 21 years old and, you know, that whole thing. So it actually, I think the separation helps it. You get to see your character uh, a few years older as well, and he's a little, somehow even more worse for, for wear than he was <laughs> the first time around. Had you been trying to get Bad Santa 2 made for, for a little while? Is this a character that you always wanted to jump back into that you loved? Well, I mean, we talked about it, <clears throat> excuse me, a long time ago. I mean, they, I, they always kind of knew we would do a sequel at some point, just not when. And uh, it was absolutely something that I thought was worthy of a sequel and uh, I'd never done one before and you know critics are hard on sequels and just by nature and uh, so we, we just wanted to make sure we got the right one before we ever did it but uh, yeah I was all for it. That must be so difficult too because Bad Santa the original is sort of one of the few comedies that's also critically praised at the same time usually comedies no matter how good they are are kind of maligned by critics but Bad Santa originally was was sort of beloved by all. Yeah, it became iconic, and we, you know, we, we didn't realize it was going to be that popular. And I mean, I I can be in the in the mall, which I go to every day. I, I'm like I'm in the mall every day. And, Where's your uh, What's your mall? Uh, that's not true. <laughs> but I had to I had to call uh, your bluff. I'm sorry. The Glendale Galleria. But um, anyway, uh, but I will have kids come up to me, and they're with their family, like little kids. They're like, Mommy, a bad Santa. And I'm like, you let your kids see that? <laughs> what kind of parent are you? But it started, a, the, the first movie started a sort of sub-genre of comedies. It was like the first one of its kind, and of the sort of darker, kind of, you know, uh, really raunchy, profane humor. And... Um, and then after it, there were a lot of uh, sort of imitators, you know, and then they, 
And now, everywhere you look, it's like, you know, bad plumber, bad, you know, dog walker, you know, whatever it is. That one I'm oh. excited for, bad dog Yeah, bad walker. dog walker. Actually, I'm in that. Yeah. <laughs> mentor. Uh, Christina, uh, you, are, I don't think I'm giving anything away. The it's in the trailers. You're kind of the love interest for the uh, character in, in this movie. How does one play the love interest, not to, to Mr. Billy Bob Thornton, but to the character that Billy Bob Thornton plays? Same thing. <laughs> love, love is a very um, polite word for, for their relationship. Um, you know, I think the naughtier and the badder he is is exactly what she likes. So um, he doesn't have to do anything. She's just attracted to, to the sort of underbelly of <laughs> human The corrosive existence. nature of his character. <laughs> yeah. uh, what, what brought you to the film? Were you a fan of the original? I had not seen the original, actually. What? I know I was the only person left um, before I got the role. But I knew it was iconic, and, I, and everyone I knew loved the film. And to work with this group of people and our director, Mark. Um, and then I read the script. And I was in a room by myself, blushing and like rocking back and forth and, um, and just laughing the whole time. So that I, you know, that for all those reasons. And Tony, you're back. Uh, you're back this time around. Were you excited to come back to Bad Santa? Oh, yeah. Just to get an opportunity to work with the man. When I, came back into, when I came back into the green room, the two of you were talking to each other like in the corner, and I was like, God, this is why Bad Santa exists. These two have incredible chemistry together. Oh, yeah, well, we always go in after each other. That's my man, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Thurman Merman, were you excited to come back? Oh, so excited. Yeah. It's, uh, like Tony said, just to get to work with this cast again, and... Like we always, like Billy said, we kind of always knew over the years and heard for probably like eight or nine years that a sequel was going to get made. But just when something sits for that long, you think it's going to be so much harder every year passing to get it off the ground. But the moment I heard about it, I was on board from the get-go. How did you work to sort of find out who your character was 13 years, years later? Well, I think that was kind of the big thing, just filling in what happened in those 13 years. Because even for any character, you'd try and play after that long, it's gonna be hard, but especially when you're going from eight to 21, like you don't know, those are such a huge development time for a kid and how much they can change. But I think once you see the movie, you realize that there is not a, that much that has changed with Thurman. And, uh, Miss Kathy Bates, the incredible Kathy Bates, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Yeah. You make anything you do better than it was before. Thankfully, this movie was, had a, has a great script going into it. Were you a fan of the original, and, and, and what brought you to this? Absolutely. Um, I, every time it's on TV and I start watching and I go, uh, even if it's in the middle, I'll go, wait, wait, wait. I want to I get to that part where they're walking down the parking lot. I just want to see these two guys walk down the parking lot and talk to each other. And oh, wait, wait, wait. I want to see that part where Bernie Mac tries to throw the kid out of the shop, you know, he's not shoplifting. Or wait, wait, I want to see the part where John Ritter's in the office going like this, you know. I mean, there are so many favorite parts that I have. So when they told me I got to play this guy's mother, I said, where do I sign up, you know? And did you, did you model your character uh, at all off of how, how, how Billy played his, his part in the first movie? Where did, you, where did your character come from? Well, um, I, it probably came from a meeting I had with Mark Waters, uh, but I think I want to take all the credit for it because um, I wanted her to be really deviant, and I've always wanted to play a deviant character. When I was younger, people would say, well, what is the role you want to play? And I'd say, Medea. You know, who's going to go see that? So uh, now I wanted to play this deviant biker chick, you know, with tats and a mohawk. I remember going to the guy that cuts my hair, and I said, Tom, I want a mohawk, and he's British. And he went, mohawk? <laughs> and I had to say it a few times before he got it, you know. And, and uh, so I really wanted to go for it, you know, and make her, you know, a, a carny. We talked, Billy Bob and I talked maybe when they were younger, and he was doing all the con, that they were probably carny folk. No, no, you know, just... Do you, no you, you think that, they were, that he was a carny? Sir? That he was born carny? Well, carny meaning that kind of lifestyle. I, probably, you know, like grifters. You Travelers, know. yeah. Yeah, sort of like uh, flim-flam <laughs> guys, you know. Uh, 
And uh, it's almost like Kathy, as when I was little, was probably like Fagan to my artful dodger, sort of, you know what I mean? And uh, so uh, I think that's, uh, I think that's probably, uh, if they had a bond, it was over stealing stuff. <laughs> Camar caramels. And caramels, oh yes, absolutely. Uh, Billy and Tony, I'm, I'm curious because you guys are the sort of uh, the, the antagonists and antiheroes of the film, yet everything you say is filthy, mean, like pretty repulsive. Do you worry at all about making your character sympathetic at any moment so that people can sort of get through the movie inside with you, or do you just feel like the script has your back in that department? I, I don't know if you ever want to try to be sympathetic. Um, just like you don't want to try to be funny or try to be moving or anything else. If you start trying to do it, it usually doesn't work. And so um, I think in this script, I mean, here's the great thing about this script, is that it, uh, the first one is just fun, you know? This one actually has a little more of a story arc and actually closer to what you call a Christmas movie yeah. uh, than the first one. And... Uh, I mean, a creepy Christmas movie, but <laughs> it's still a creepy Absolutely. movie. Yeah. But anyway, uh, there's more emotion in this one, and I think one of the great things you get to see in here is that my relationship to Kathy as my mother, you get to see kind of where Willie came from and why he is the way he is, and at the end of the day, you just see, well, yeah, he's an abused, neglected kid who sees himself in this one here, who all, he sees another kid who probably never had a chance. And so in, in that way, I know it sounds crazy, but it kind of is a, a, kind of a moving, you know, Christmas movie. It's a family it's just, movie. It is kind of a family movie for, for families oh, that... <laughs> it's, a, it's a family movie for people who don't mind uh, watching really profane stuff. That's exactly, that's exactly what it is. Thematically, it's a family movie. Maybe not on the surface, it's a family movie. Tony, uh, Billy gets to explore his backstory in this movie. Have you thought about your character's backstory at all? How, how prison was for him? Yeah, well, everything got pinned on me. You know, he, he pinned everything on me. Uh, and uh, that's why he was able to get out, because he testified against me. So he was able to get out. You tried to kill me. I, no, I did. <laughs> But I mean, you, you didn't work without me. I needed you and you needed me. But I knew how to get you. And that was with money. <laughs> money always brings Willie back. <laughs> ah. Wait, you two are actually like pretty amazing together in person too. When you guys made the first movie, did you audition together? Did you audition with Billy? Or did, how did, was there like what they call chemistry reads between the two of you? Because you are incredible together on screen. Well, thank you. Um, I remember reading with Bernie Mac on a Wednesday and reading with Billy on a Friday. And after we did that first scene, <laughs> what? I'm, I'm telling you, you put your microphone on oh, your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't still yeah. going like Yeah, that. I was like, what is he doing? I was getting the wrong idea. <laughs> you really like his story. After, uh, after we did the first scene, I remember the director, Terry Zygoff, was saying, how do you guys feel? And I remember Billy saying, you can't do nothing more with that. And I was like, I think that was one of the best readings I had ever done. You know, but he brought that out in me. Absolutely. Uh, Christina, uh, your character has some pretty filthy moments in this movie uh, herself. Um, were they initially in the script? How did you feel about going into doing those scenes? Uh, they were in the script. And I thought, how fun. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I did. Uh, they're clearly sort of uncomfortable seeming scenes. We were in coats and sweaters and, and boots. Yeah, that is the and thing about your sex scenes. Took some it. of the awkwardness away, you know. And um, sometimes the thing that's the most awkward in, in sex scenes is having to fall in love and kiss and all that. And we just, oh. we just banged. So, <laughs> <laughs> Not to put it the wrong way, nothing against the two of you. There's nothing sexy about your sex scenes in this movie. Nothing sexy at all. It's pure animal. Which is kind of different from, from the first one. I rewatched the first one just the other night, and the, the sex scenes that you have in that 
are at moments like a bit slower and he's a bit more thoughtful going into it. And this one, he's just a disgusting wreck looking for anything to plow, no offense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> we can just... We, uh, <laughs> we just took some moments from my real life and put them in the movie. No. Uh, it's not true. <laughs> Uh, Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> no, we, you know, in, in the first movie, there was, it was, I mean, once you got past the hookers, you know, there was, and, and I was with Lauren Graham, it was kind of an odd little family, you know, and so I think that made it a little bit different. And, uh, I mean, in the first movie, when Thurman comes in to give me the wooden pickle he made me, and here I am right there with Lauren on the floor and everything's fine with the Sandy hat and everything else. And then he has to come in with the wooden pickle and break my heart, you know? So, I mean, you know, Willie always had a heart. It's just that he also has a heart on. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. I like that one. Uh, there is something about watching you return to this movie 13 years later where it for some reason, it does feel like this is your family when you're watching it. Does it feel like that on set for you? This is maybe the the biggest project that you're a part of or that you've been a part of. Oh, for sure. Um, I think even whenever before we even got on set and we had our first meetings down in L.A. for it, it was maybe five minutes talking to each other, and it was like a just snap back right like that. Like me and Billy had seen each other a couple times over the years, but nothing too much that we would still have that chemistry, but it really just kind of came back right away. So it was really like we had never been apart. Kathy, uh, you're incredible, I think, at playing uh, menacing at times. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're very good at playing menacing, but then I also think about roles like uh, about Schmidt, which are somewhat similar almost to this role here, except far more profane and filthy. Do you feel like you gravitate towards certain, certain roles? Oh yeah, I like to play m madness and um, insanity and nuts and crazy and killer and you know all of that stuff. Is that true? <laughs> really? Well, why not? I mean, you go through life, somebody innocent and nice, been there, done that. <laughs> you know. So if I mean, you know, for me, acting is just dressing up and playing pretend. So why wouldn't you be? Oh, I'm going to be the villain for this one. I mean, wouldn't you want to be that when you were kids? You know, I'm going to play the bad guy. So, I don't know. I come from a, from a very childlike point of view that I'd like to hold a cleaver. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a catharsis in it for you at all? Is there what? A catharsis in it for you at all? Uh, you mean, do I get my rocks off? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sure, let's just say that, yeah. <laughs> Catharsis is kind of an ancient word. I think get your rocks off is kind of modern day catharsis. Um, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, I just feel like, you know, done it, you know, and it just feels, yeah, I felt useful, man. You know, I did my thing. So suddenly I'm talking like, I don't know, street or punk or something. You got, you got the Bad Santa 2 vibes. And yeah, you got it. You yeah. gave it to me, man. You just sent it to me over here. When you're shooting a movie like this, obviously you, you have to find out where the line is for what's going to work in the edit room. Did you, is there stuff that even went over the line for you guys while shooting this movie that you said or was part of the script or you tried that even like just didn't make it into the movie? Well, believe it or not, there are rules within the bad Santa world. And, um, you know, most people think, well, if you're doing a movie like that, you just do whatever you want. But actually, the tone is very specific. And uh, we were just very careful to not go outside that tone. And sometimes, you know, Mark uh, or the studio people would have things that they wanted us to do, and then the writers had written certain lines, and I'd say, yeah, Willie wouldn't do that. And they said, well, I thought Willie would do anything. I said, yeah, he would do that, but he wouldn't do that with that person at that time. Or whatever, you know? So do you feel a certain ownership over, over this character? Because he is, at this point, an iconic character that, that, that you initially played and play now. Do you feel an ownership, and did you have a heavy involvement in the script and, and on set? Well, I mean, only because, I mean, you know, Tony and Brett and I were the only ones involved in this movie that were in the first one. 
So they had to kind of rely on us to a degree to, you know, know if that's kind of the way we would do it. Uh, uh, but no, I mean, we, we just go do our jobs. But we, since the three of us had done it before, we kind of knew what that tone was. And, uh, you know, I mean, sometimes, I mean, even Willie is not, uh, not an evil person, you know. I mean, he's nasty. He's not evil. And also, Willie didn't talk much in the first movie. You know, Willie's not a proactive guy. <laughs> he's a reactive guy. And so in the first draft of the script that I saw, I had long monologues, you know, where I was being the aggressor and stuff. But Willie's too drunk to be a, 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 the aggressor. He just can't figure stuff out. Willie's just a guy who wanders around and gets in stuff all the time. And so we cut the dialogue down quite a bit uh, because I just had too many long speeches. So that, that's an example of something that we watched for. Tony, Brett, I'm curious, were, was there anything like that for you guys when you saw the, the first drafts of the script where you thought my character might be a little more like this? Do you think we could try this with my character? Not necessarily. Well, for, my, for Thurman, I think it's a bit easier because there's probably like only four or five things in the world like, that he can keep in his head at any given time. So there's not really a lot going on up there. But like what Billy said, it's, you can never, there's no worry of going too far in that, like, oh, this is like even beyond rated R. It's just more that it doesn't make sense with either the story or the characters. So there was never a point where it was like, oh, we're going to offend people too much and doing things for sake of offense or keeping it clean. It's just there might be something you'd read. And it's just, it doesn't really make sense in terms of the tone of the first one and the tone we were going for this one. Or even just like slight little word choice kind of things were probably the biggest changes that would be made where they might say something. They, they, there's no problem with them saying it, but they would say it in a different way. So I think it was slight little changes like that for the most part. Can I chime in? Because yeah. uh, Tony and I, we can talk Don't. about this. We had a lot longer fight. Let's just say with extremely on PC racial epithets. Yeah slung at each other, and we were really sorry they didn't make it in the movie. Right. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, maybe they thought I went too far or something, but it was pretty good, yeah, wasn't we were, it? We were going at each other. <laughs> yeah. It was pretty good, well, yeah. Throwing racial slurs at each other? Yeah, hell, and we made it all up. It was really cool, so anyway. Maybe it'll be in the final cut or something, you know, when they send the DVD out or something. Right. Yeah, yeah send it to Trump. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. I'll embrace it. Uh, Tony, what about you? Was there any notes or feelings that you had going into a second one on on on, on who your character was and what he should be in this in this world? For me? Yeah. Uh, for me, it's just to me. For me, it's just let it go, let it go, let it go. <laughs> you know. I mean, the character was basically the same. Everybody knows what's gonna come out Marcus' mouth. You know, and I'm gonna let loose. So it was still the same for me. Uh, I'm gonna open up to the audience right now for questions. Does anyone have any questions out there? You, hey, sir. Hey, uh, it's so great having you guys here. I'm like really looking forward to the sequel. Um, do you, uh, were there any uh, like crazy moments on set or like uh, how, how, how was it like being on set? And uh, do you approach doing comedy any differently than doing like maybe a more dramatic or serious role? There's this one time when, you know, I kind of grew up in a way that uh, I, I know more language of the people. I, I grew up in like the, down by the railroad tracks. And also Tony and I, our roots are down in Arkansas, Alabama and places like that. So we have a certain language that maybe Mark Waters wasn't aware of. <laughs> and there was one, you remember this? So we're in a van doing a scene and the first take we did, Tony said, uh, his line of dialogue was, he said, the, the concert start in five minutes. Mark Waters yells across the stage, Tony, the concert starts in five minutes. Can you say that? And I said, no, he can't. <laughs> and he said, uh, what? it starts. And I said, yeah, but... He said it that way, so let him say it the way he says it, you know. And then I had a couple of words like that. So we had this running joke that Mark was like the straightest glass of milk you've ever been in around in your life. 
he just, you know, like some of the language that Tony and I would use, he just didn't know why we were saying it or, or what it meant sometimes. And he would, he would change a line, and then we would say, no, that's, that's how you say that particular thing. You know, what, what did you live in a hole your whole life? <laughs> and uh, so it, it became a fun thing on set. And Mark is very self-deprecating, very nice guy, so he took it from us. But... We got on him about the language quite a few times. Uh, next question. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, this question is specifically for Kathy and Christina. Um, I love both of your work, um, and I love that the roles that you choose to play, and I was wondering if you had any advice for women trying to navigate this industry. Wow. Oh, gosh. Um, I always feel like I'm not qualified to give advice. <laughs> um, you know, uh, the, the way that I've gone about choosing things and moving forward, um, you know, for the longest time, you just take who chooses you because you just need a job. Um, and, and luckily, I'm in a place now that I get to read things and, and choose projects. And, and I just, I sort of know it when I read it. I feel like if, if there's something that I can help contribute or I can help tell that story in the best way and and I get excited about it when I read it, that's how I choose a project. I've never really had a, a strategy or some sort of, well, I did, I did this comedy, so I, the next one better be a drama. I, I've, never, I've never done that. So I just try to be very true to myself and, and that I could bring something to it. I'd say exactly the same thing. Uh, and I'd only add that uh, early on, uh, I think it's true for a lot of women, and, and it's probably, you know, uh, it's getting a lot better, and I certainly can't complain after Ryan Murphy came into my life, but um, you, I, I had to pay the rent, you know, for a long time. I didn't come to Hollywood till I was in my 40s, and even then, I, after that, you know, I remember going to Ned Beatty's house after I won the Oscar, and he put his hand on me, and he said, heal! <laughs> because a lot of times after the Oscar, you never work again. <laughs> you know, they go, okay, they rang the bell. Okay, next. And um, so I, 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 but I, yeah, that, I guess that, I, I guess the advice I'd give women is to stick with it. I was told from the very beginning, you know, you're not attractive enough, you weigh too much, you're this, you're that. You know, and all I wanted to do was what I love to do and be the very best at it. Because my feeling was, is if you... My feeling is if you can be the very best at it, then they'll want you. You such great talent up on the stage all together. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> top of, the, top of the, the list there. Um, this really is specifically, I guess, for Kathy and Billy. Um, since you both have played such iconic, dark characters in drama, um, is, it, is there any difference playing dark characters in a comedic way? Or do you play it really essentially the same? <laughs> um, uh, n no, I mean, there is kind of a tone, but you always have to be truthful. And you always have to be real. I'm doing something now. I'm doing my first sitcom for... T Chuck Lorre, we shot it Wednesday night, and Jimmy Burroughs, who's this amazing director, who's directed everything, every pilot that's ever been on TV, you know, when he said goodbye to me, he said, just be natural, you know, just be real, and, uh, and, and you can't try to be anything. Same thing with this, you know, I just had fun being the character. I mean, it was like, you know, playing in the mud, <laughs> you know, just having a good time, and uh, that's what... I mean, I didn't think about anybody else, actually, because uh, Sonny doesn't really think about anybody else. The only thing she's thinking about is his fingers on that, <laughs> on that safe, you know, in, in three minutes so she can get the money and go to Mexico. So, I mean, that's the world I lived in. Yeah, that. I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think that one of the... Uh, common misconceptions, uh, you know, about comedy is that you go out there to act funny, you know, and if you do that, you're probably going to not be funny. I mean, to tell you the truth, uh, you have to, uh, you have to believe in a 
character in a comedy as much as you do in a drama. You can't, uh, I mean, it's like this. Academy Awards don't, um, for the most part, recognize comedy. I mean, you know, the Golden Globes have a comedy category and all that kind of stuff. So in all the award things, I always thought it was odd because we look at some of our heroes over the years, Charlie Chaplin and and Buster Keaton and all these people, Laurel and Hardy and, and you know, Martin and Lewis, whoever it is. And, and then when you do comedy, you see how hard it is because in comedy, you're... Uh, you can watch a drama, and if there's no reaction from an audience, you know, uh, then, you know, you, you still don't know what they think. But comedy is looking for a specific result, and that's to make people laugh with, at, and sympathize with a character. It's, it's not easy. And so you have to go in there, and, you, and I have to play this part and all of us up, up here have to play these parts as if we're De Niro and Christopher Walken in The Deer Hunter. You know what I mean? I mean, you have to go all the way in. I mean, like when they say, well, don't you feel weird saying those things around little kids and everything? You can't feel weird. Just like you can't feel weird if you're playing Charles Manson, you know, whoever it is. You have to be Charles Manson. You can't be 70% of him. And so I'd say, yeah, you, ha you have to jump in with both feet when you're playing any character, and a, and a comedy is no different. You have to play it real. Do you think it's a mistake that the uh, Academy doesn't celebrate comedies as much as they do? I mean, you think about screenwriting, for instance, when it comes to a comedy, it takes so much technical proficiency to write a good comedy screenplay. Just the mathematics of it are, are, are crazy, and we never celebrate comedy screenplays. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think it's a shame that they're they're not uh, more of a part of it, because uh, it, I mean, if maybe there's a reason for it that I don't know about, but if the reason is is that they don't take those as seriously, then that's probably not cool. Because uh, there've been a, I mean, a lot of our heroes are come from the world of humor, you know. And there's one job in the entertainment business that scares me probably more than anything else. Uh, and that is stand-up comedy. Like, uh, I mean, I respect those people so much because you come up on a stage in front of everybody to make people laugh. That's why you're there. And you know instantly if you're horrible. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's like the second you go out there, within two minutes, it's like, wow, i got to be out of here another there are 15 minutes, how am I going to do this? It's just, uh, so there is an art to it, and there's, uh, and also the great comedians were people that broke your heart too, in some way, or uh, got under your skin somehow. They're not just funny, there's something else too. You know. Absolutely, I think we have time for one more question. Hi, everyone. Um, so I feel like great comedy stems from truth. I was wondering for each of you, what do you think your character's truth was? If that makes sense. What do you think your character's truth was? <laughs> so sorry. That was amazing, Kevin. Very well. Oh, no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, could, what, great comedy comes from truth. What do you think your character's truth was? I guess, what do you think your character's core is? Start with Billy. <laughs> <laughs> Can we just take that as your That's answer, Tony? You. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I think what I said earlier, I think Willie is a guy who's afraid to get too close to anything or love anything because he didn't have a childhood that was any good. And he'd love to tell Thurman that, look, you're kind of like my kid now. But he probably doesn't want to lose another thing. And so I think, I think at the end of the day, Willie's truth is that he's a, a neglected, abused child who never, you know, wants to go back there again, stays drunk all day, and, and is cynical about life and doesn't, at least acts like he doesn't care about life. And in fact, 
probably probably the bane of his existence is that he does have hope because that's what keeps him there and that's what's painful you know having hope and not knowing if you're ever going to have anything you know his, so i'd be mine his hope is kind of what keeps him ashamed and which also keeps him drunk like he's a well, i was thinking about that character i was thinking his truth in a lot of ways is shame he's always ashamed of himself which is why he's always reacting and acting this way with other people christina I think Diane sort of operates from shame as well. I think she's a person who's constantly trying to convince herself that she's good and that she's doing good things while she's fighting her demons. And, and her demons are const, constant conflict for her that make her feel like she's not a good person. Better so she than, overcompensates. Better than her own desires, to a degree. What? She, she's trying to be better than her own desires. Yes. Yeah. Sermon? I think I like I think a lot of people think this and even I've said this before that Thurman's just stupid but I think it's that's kind of glossing over it too much it's almost like he's willfully ignorant of everything around him in a way it's like he's built this own kind of fantasy land in his world to get past the fact that he's never really have had anyone that loved him except in a way for Willie which might not be the best <laughs> so he just kind of creates this fantasy land in his own head that he doesn't even necessarily believe, which he even hints to and will say at times, just so he doesn't have to be so sad and he just kind of wanders around forcefully in a way making himself happy so he doesn't have to realize the reality of his situation. Kathy? I thought of one. <laughs> and this may get too dark, because that's my nature. I can clean out a room. Um, into party. Uh, so <clears throat> when I was thinking about her, I thought that when she was younger, you know, and she had willing and everything, and she just decided she was going to kick that aside and the husband and everything else. And But she was used to being with a man all the time, and she hooked up with this guy who was this biker. And then when I thought about biker chicks, you know what they do is they ride for miles and miles hanging onto a man. And I think metaphorically, she fell off a bunch of times, and she decided, okay, that's it. And she was kind of like, um, you know, um, uh, Scarlett O'Hara when she decided, I'm never going to be without money again. And she loves to have a good time. She loves to drink. She loves to smoke. And she's incredibly tough because she doesn't ever want to be at the mercy of anyone else again. And there's a moment, I think, that we have in the van where she remembers the connection that she had with him. There was a kind of purity there. And, and, and like for you guys, you know, seeing him grown up, for me seeing you grown up is kind of funny, you know, and fun. And uh, so for a moment there, she, she starts to say, parent, and <laughs> I think I slipped on the line or something. Yeah. But it was a good thing. It was a good moment that she just doesn't want to be a parent you know, at all. She don't want to be tied to anybody. And there was a thing that was in the movie. I'm going too long. Y'all are going over, right? Um, <clears throat> we had a scene in the movie that was a really good scene. And I think we rewrote it and everything. And I got too dark. And um, But we did this scene where she lies to him. And she said all the coughing is due to uh, cancer. And that she wants him to come spend Christmas with her in Mexico. They're going to take the money together. And she gives him the gun with the, you know, the bullets in it and everything. And uh, so it's just the ultimate con, you know, so that when she turns on him at the end. But I was worried when we were riding down to New York, we were talking about it a lot. I said, you know, I don't think this is the right tone for this movie. And God bless Mark Waters, he took that crap out, you know, because it's a delicate thing, this movie. You really, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's you want it to be, you know. Anyway, mic drop. <laughs> well, I think for me, thinking about it, I think it's the fact because Marcus is a little person, and people have been down on him all his life and the way that people looked at him. So this character gives me a chance to let go, you know, looking at Willie and, and him and I going after each other. I think it's a way of me, you know, really like getting back, you know, being, being like a strong in the bay where everybody looked down at me, and for once, I can say what I want to say and say it in a way that I want to say with all the profanity that I use you know, because I've been hurt for all these years. And I think that, for me, that's Marcus. Absolutely, that's incredible. Uh, guys, so the movie oh. comes out next week, right? Yeah, it, yeah, it comes out on the uh, 23rd, which is uh, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving weekend. It comes on 23rd. I just have to add one thing. It's just a little trivia. 
for people who like this kind of thing. Something you may have noticed, may have not noticed before. This is about posters. When you see the new poster, it's got me and Tony on there. I'm turned around, obviously peeing in a, in a Christmas bucket. But they take the stream out. You can't see the stream. It's like so you can, <laughs> so you can know that I'm peeing. You just can't see that I'm peeing. Okay. And on the first poster, I mean, the only reason I bring this up is it's happened on both movies. Same thing. I'm turning around peeing, no stream. On the first movie, the poster is me with the Santa Claus sack over my shoulder uh, with Marcus and the kid and, uh, and Lauren. And I'm giving the devilish look like this and everything. And I have a toothpick in my mouth. Well, I had a cigarette in my mouth. That's what I had in my mouth. <laughs> During the whole photo shoot, I'm sitting there because Willie smokes. It's obvious. So I'm hanging there with a, you know, with a cigarette hanging out of my mouth with a Christmas sack. Well, of course, that wasn't cool. So they take the cigarette out. Okay, I understand. If you want to be a punk like that and take the cigarette out, go ahead. I'll get your little marketing creepy stuff. <laughs> but why put a toothpick in place of it? I mean, is Willie like into dental hygiene? Did he just have a, <laughs> did he just have a steak? I mean, I, I, don't, I didn't understand. It's like, how about just don't put anything there? Take the cigarette out and have nothing. But they put a toothpick. It's like, what a tough guy. There he is with his toothpick. I don't know. So no pee stream, and it's a toothpick, not a cigarette. Let's clip that out and send it to the marketing team behind the, behind the movie and see what they have to say about it. Guys, Bad Santa 2 opens in theaters next week, Thanksgiving weekend. Take your family. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys.